And let's, uh, let's start with the prayer. We're going to go on with uh, Acts chapter 22. So let's, uh, let's start with the prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you asking, Father, that you will fill us with your ways, with your spirit, with your mind, with your heart, and with the heart of your dear Son. And we do pray that we may enter more deeply into your word, into your purpose and your plan for us, and that we, like Paul, will stand alone with the world behind us and the cross before us. For his sake. Amen. Amen. Right, so Paul has been giving this, uh, this talk about how he was converted on the road to Damascus, what I spoke about yesterday. And he says, you know, I was converted, and then the Lord Jesus said to me, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And of course, the Jews thought that only Jews could be saved. And it says they listened until this word. And then they lifted up their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, it's not fitting that he should live. And as they cried out and threw off their cloaks and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the fortress. So, they got furious at the idea that other people, apart from Jews, could get saved. And this is an unfortunate feature of human nature, that people get so mad and angry because other people are getting saved. I've noticed that. It's a human thing that, oh, they've got something great going for them, and I haven't, because the people choose not to have it, and they get cranky about it. As so the Lord Jesus taught in one of his parables, is your eye evil because I am good? This is really how it is, that it's all about grace, and grace means this free gift, that God is offering us eternity, salvation in his kingdom, not on the basis of works. All you've got to do is say yes. All you've got to do is trust. You see, to believe means to trust. To have faith means to trust. To trust that actually your sin is not a barrier. All your dysfunctions and all your weakness is not a barrier. And that you will live forever. It's as simple as that, by his grace, by his gift. And yet we are wired, you see, to think that, no, I must do works to deserve it. People say, oh, no, I can't accept that. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good person. Well, no, you're not a good person. Who is in that sense? Nobody is. It's not by works, Paul says, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. The wages of sin is death. Sin pays wages, death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So... When people are confronted with this, they don't like it. They do not like it. They think that, oh no, you know, that's, that's not okay. Um, we don't want that. Uh, you've got to be good enough. And that's why religions that say you've got to do certain things to get saved, they're very popular. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I've got to uh, say the rosary. I've, I've got to give money. I've got to do this, that or the other. Oh yeah, people like the idea of that. If you say, you know what, you don't need to do anything, nothing at all, you just got to believe. Oh no, people don't like that. They find that not to their taste. But actually true Christianity, Christianity in its true form, is I would say the only religion that, that talks about grace. That it is a pure gift. Yes, your sin is serious, but it's dealt with and it's, and it's all okay because of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, here these Jews get mad, fuming mad. Why get, why get so steamed up about it? If someone has a different religious view to you, well, so they do. Take it easy. But why get so mad that you throw your cloaks off and throw dust in the air and try and kill the guy who's preaching it? Well, it's obvious why. It's because your conscience has been touched. And as I keep on saying, what it is to be a Christian is to surrender hands up surrender and not keep going against your conscience like Jesus said to Paul how hard it is for you to kick against the prods there he was like an animal like an ox that's plowing or a horse that's being ridden and it's kept on the track by prod 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 turn to the turn to the right horsey prod prod turn to the left oxen and the Lord is saying you don't want to be like that I've been trying to do that to you. 
Now that's a very painful, miserable way to live. And that's why a lot of people, whether they are rich or poor, successful or not successful in secular life, it's why their life is not great, not that enjoyable. Well, they threw off their cloaks, they took the jackets off, because they wanted to kill Paul. And when you look at this whole thing, that Paul is giving this long speech to the Jews, and they, they listen to him so far, and then they take their, their jackets off because they, they want to they wanna kill him. And he appeals to them, and he's touched their conscience. This is all very similar to what happened when Stephen was killed. Stephen also gives a long talk. And actually, Paul is alluding to Stephen's talk, but that's another, another story. And then they take their coats off and put their coats at the feet of Paul, and they stone Stephen to death. So you see, what Paul had done to Stephen is now being done to him. That's quite a theme. Now, that's not simply that there's some kind of karma in life whereby what goes around comes around. Just as some sort of, I don't know, poetic way of, uh, of doing it. No. Why that sort of thing happens is because God wants us to understand the feelings of the people whom we have hurt and sinned against. And we have all sinned against people. Now, in the case of Stephen and Paul, the last thing that Stephen saw was this evil Paul, Saul as his name then was, looking at, looking at him, just full of hatred and the stones being thrown and until one of them hit his head, I guess, and knocked him out. The next waking moment, Stephen is going to be in the kingdom of God. Paul will have been resurrected, and he's going to meet Paul. Well, how are those two going to get along in eternity? Of course, Stephen's going to forgive Paul. He's going to be delighted that Paul's there. And he's going to marvel at how his prayer for Paul when he says, you know, don't hold this sin to their charge, he's going to be delighted that his prayer for Saul's salvation got answered in such an amazing way. But, you see, what the Lord did in Paul's life after that was to help Paul to understand how Stephen had felt. And life happens, and stuff happens in life, and you think, oh, why did that happen? Why did this happen? And you can't immediately say, oh yes, I know why that happened because of so and so and such and such. It's not that simple. But what we can be assured of is that in the bigger picture, every, everything in life has meaning. And that's the worst thing. That's why people do drugs, they get depressed, they get anxious, they, their life falls apart because they think, what's the point of my living? I'm just existing day by day on this planet. That's a very nice wing tone, mate. Can you just turn it down? Yeah. So, what I'm saying is that life has meaning. Life is not random, right? It's all got its purpose and its meaning. So, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the fortress, bidding that, they should, that he should be examined by scourging, by whipping, that he might know for what cause they so shouted against him. So the uh, Roman captain is a bit confused. Why do these Jews so hate Paul? What's going on? He doesn't understand. So he said, you better torture Paul and see what's going on. What, why? Why is there this upset? And that's a theme that, Paul, that uh, Luke brings out in Acts very often. That the Romans are, are amazed. Why are these Jews so cranky? With Paul, Pilate was the same about the Lord Jesus. What, what, what evil has the guy done? What's your problem? You were crucified. What, why? And yes, this is a question. Why do people react so strongly against the Christian message? You are someone like Spyro or myself or, Gail or Jonathan or whoever goes out there on the streets and talks to people. You don't have to get a lot of people cussing you when you mention Jesus. Why? Why not just walk on? What's your problem? 
And the problem is that you are touching their conscience. So if you're an evangelist and you think, ah, oh, nobody's interested, you know, everybody is interested underneath. The, the mask of, oh, I, I, I don't do religion, oh, I'm not interested in all that God stuff. Yeah, underneath all that, uh, people are. You've got to approach them the right way. But people are also, uh, like Paul, they don't want to surrender. They don't want to surrender and say, yeah, I give in, I, I give up. Now for us, just give in. Just give in to God's call. What's the point to resist it? You'd be, you're far happier when you say yes. You really are. So, when the, uh, verse 25, when they tied him up the thongs, Paul said to the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard it, he went to the chief captain and told him, saying, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman. He means a Roman citizen. The chief captain came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The chief captain answered, with a great sum of money, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I am Roman born. So, you wonder why Paul waits until they've tied him up. They're going to whip him. Right? And he's like tied up, I guess, with his hands there, and they've got thongs on his hands, and they're, they're holding him back. And then he, he turns around and says to the guy, you know what, mate, I'm a Roman citizen. And they weren't allowed to do that to Roman citizens. I'm a Roman citizen, by the way, mate. Think, why, why do you say that before, Paul? And I noticed with Paul, I mean, I think Paul was great. But I, I, I do notice a, a sort of a slightly sort of sarcastic kind of sort of a bit like myself, sorry to say, the sort of thing I would have done. Wait till the last minute. And say, oh, by the way, mate, I'm a Roman citizen. What? Oh, oh, whoopsie, we're in trouble. He does this in Philippi as well. Um, when he's in prison and he goes through it, through it all and then afterwards he says, oh, by the way, gents, I'm a Roman citizen. You're going to be in a lot of trouble, you are, for what you did to me. Oh, whoops. Come to him and I'm very respectful and greasing up to him and so forth. <laughs> Well, why, why he did it, why he waited to the last minute before saying this, I, well, that could have been for various reasons, but putting it together, what I'm saying is you see in Paul someone human. You see humanity. And yet this is a man who, who probably, like very few other human beings, got to the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, despite being like us, despite having all our, you know, sort of st stuff that goes on in your head, etc. So, <clears throat> then those that were about to torture him withdrew from him immediately. And the chief captain also was afraid when he knew that Paul was a Roman citizen because he bound him. You can imagine Paul sort of smirking to himself. It's not a very Christian attitude, but I reckon that's the sort of thing I would do. Unfortunately, I have that sort of mind as some people do sort of, ha ha, who's laughing now? Who's bricking themselves up now? You, ha ha. You know? It's not a very smart thing to do, but what I'm saying is that he was human and he wasn't perfect. And it's in that, in his weakness, that I, I really think Paul was just great. Well, the next day, desiring to know with certainty why he was accused by the Jews, he released him. He commanded the chief priests and all the council to come together and brought Paul down and set him before them. Again, as I say, the Romans are always presented as wondering why on earth are these Jews getting so worked up with this guy, Paul, who's talking about someone called Jesus, who is dead, who Paul says is alive, uh, and who he says can forgive you your sins and save you, and it's salvation by grace, not by keeping the law of Moses. Why are you getting so steamed up? And for these Roman guys who, who are like the judges and that, they don't understand it. And as I say, that is a, to me a, a very powerful point that it really demonstrates that people have got this deep conscience within them. Everyone has got it. There's a hole in the heart that only Jesus will fill. And people know actually intuitively whether they should be accepting Je that they should be accepting Jesus. So there's any of you here who have not yet been baptised, say yes to him and do it today. Come back to our place in South Croydon, you get baptised, 
Vladimir did on uh, Monday evening, and uh, three Iranians did uh, yesterday evening. Go for it. You have nothing to lose. If it's into a religion, oh yeah, you better check it all out ahead of time. But uh, just into Jesus, you have nothing to lose. I don't know anybody who ever got baptized who later regretted it. And I baptized you know, many thousands of people. And nobody regretted it. People might regret, oh, what do you tell me to go to that church for? They were fake, they were this. Oh, yeah, plenty of that. Yeah, yeah. But Jesus, no. Absolutely no. No disillusion. Right, so chapter 23, Paul looked straight at the council and he said, Brothers, I've lived before God in all good conscience until this day. Well, as I said to you before, when I was a young man, I was in the Soviet Union and living there, and I, atheism was a subject. Tanya also here, Tatiana was also from that background. And there was a predmet, uh, there was like a subject, let's say, atheism. And I was reading some of the textbooks that were used to teach this. And they make all these criticisms of the Bible. So, ah, this is all rubbish. The Bible is not correct. And I remember reading about this verse. And they're saying, ah, you can tell this is rubbish because Paul looks at the, uh, at the judges, at the council, and he, said, and he starts off by saying, brothers, it's oh no, 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 it's like in a court. If you're in court before the judge, you're supposed to say your honor, your excellency. You don't say, well, bro, I'm just going to answer. You don't call the, the judge bro or brother. Hey, brother. No, nah, brother, you got that wrong, mate. No, you don't. Your excellency, your, your honor, I defend myself this way or the other. No, I don't think the Bible's wrong. I think that is what Paul said. Because his point is, yeah, you sit there to judge me. All you guys, you sit there to judge me, but you, we're all brothers. We are in the same boat. We're all sinners. And we're going to die. And that, as I said the other day, that, that appeal to people on the basis of your common humanity, on the basis of your common humanity, that's... Uh, that's it, actually what God does to us through the Lord Jesus, because he had our human nature. So he says, brothers, I have lived before God in all good conscience until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Like, how dare you say such a blasphemous thing, that I have lived before God in all good conscience until this day. And I, I do also wonder a little bit about Paul saying this, because the Lord has said to him, Paul, on the road to Damascus, it is hard for you to kick against the prods of conscience. So he did have a bad conscience, and the Lord Jesus kept prodding him. And I said yesterday that the Lord Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem at the same time as Paul lived there, because he says, I was brought up from a child in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. And most of the... 70%, I'd say, of all the things that are recorded in the Gospels happen in Jerusalem, mainly at the Jewish feasts. And so Paul would have met Jesus. He would have heard Jesus. He would have seen him doing miracles. But his conscience denied it all. But he says here, I've, I've always had a good conscience. He also admits that he persecuted Christians... He tortured Christians, and he says he tortured them unto death. Well, how's that? You tortured Christians to death. And you did this big time. But he says, oh no, I've, I've always had a good conscience. How? How? You'd have thought, man, isn't your conscience just killing you, mate, that you killed all those Christians? Let alone torturing people, men and women, torturing them to death. You know, deny Jesus. Somebody say, no, I'm not going to. Well, I'm going to torture you even more. You know, the sort of stuff that goes on in places like Iran and Afghanistan today. Deny Jesus Christ. You know, cigarette lighter on testicles and things like that. Deny Jesus, deny Jesus. 
And Paul says, I tortured people to death. <coughs> there were people there who didn't deny and who died at Paul's hands. This is extrajudicial murder. Because when the Jews wanted to crucify the Lord, they had to go to the Romans and say, can you do it? We have a law. By our law, he should die. But we don't have the power to do that. You, you've got to do it. But he, he did it with his own hands. Took the law to his own, his law into his own hands. So we're left with this question. How can he say, I've got this amazingly clear conscience? Well, here's the thing. We're going to take the bread and the juice now that represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And Paul teaches in Hebrews that he says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses the conscience. He says a very powerful thing. But the blood of Jesus Christ not only brings forgiveness of sin, but cleanses the conscience. That is a step beyond even forgiveness. And why this is hard to understand by you and me is that we've never experienced that kind of forgiveness. Because when human beings sin against each other, what can you do? You have a choice to forgive or not, but in the end, you end up saying, well, play on. You know, if you steal 10 quid out of my pocket, well, what do I do? Well, all right, I'll forgive you. But in the end, it's, I'm just saying, okay, mate, I'm not going to raise it again. That's finished, just play on, like it didn't happen. But that doesn't do anything to your conscience. That doesn't make you right with God. The fact I said, okay, I forgive you, or you forgive me. There's something bad I did to you. Okay. You for, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you. Okay, you forgave me. Right, thanks, mate. I appreciate it. But I'm still left with my conscience. You can't do anything to my conscience. I can't do anything to your conscience. But the forgiveness that you encounter from God through the Lord Jesus. Let me give the juice out. The forgiveness that we encounter from God through the Lord Jesus Christ is of a completely different nature than anything we have ever experienced. It is the same when we talk about the love of God. It's the same when we talk about the love of God. When you talk about grace, well, the difficulty is that we have not experienced love like his love. You experience love from your parents, from your partner, from your kids, from, I don't know, people in life. Yeah, from your granny. Yeah. But that love that you experienced is nothing compared to the nature and quality of his love. We've experienced forgiveness. But it is not like the forgiveness that comes from God. We've experienced grace. Somebody might do a random good deed to you. Yep, we've experienced that. But that is different to this radical grace of God. You've never received salvation in the sense of eternal life. You've never received forgiveness to the point that the conscience is cleansed to the point that you get it in Jesus. And when I think about this, I beg you, all of you here are not yet Christians fully, to, to, to accept Jesus Christ, to accept this, to be baptized into Jesus, to accept the meaning of this bread and this cup, because it means your forgiveness, it means your salvation, it means a life and an experience like nothing else. Like nothing else can possibly give you in this world. Money can't buy you forgiveness. Sex can't get you forgiveness. Business success, massive pension, unlimited spending money, that can't give you grace, that can't give you salvation, that can't give you forgiveness. It's all rubbish. It is only what has been achieved through the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that has got any final meaning. So let's try, in very human words, to thank God for what these symbols represent. 
Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, Father, with all the difficulty that man has coming to you, to thank you, Father, from the bottom of our hearts, absolutely, for him, for your son, for your love to us through him, and for the forgiveness and the cleansing of conscience and the rewriting of the human mind that can happen because of him. And we thank you for that. And we beg you that we might be able to persuade other, other people, men and women and boys and girls, of that, that wonderful truth and that wonderful priceless experience. For Jesus' sake, to his glory. Amen. Amen.